about some other things and uh, proceed from there. I hope we get to have a little conversation after this. Um, so my mama, <coughs> Janice Ewell Robinson, don't like liars. In fact, she hates liars. She'll abide a thief in certain circumstances, but she can't stand a liar. I don't think she has ever lied in her life using that southern strategy of not saying anything if you can't say anything nice or true, which was hard for her because she talked a lot and she liked to tell the truth about things, so she learned to become a diplomat of sorts. She was so averse to lying that she had to give up her career in real estate because she couldn't sell black people terrible homes at terrible rates without telling them the homes were terrible and the rates were terrible. And I remember being a little girl just saying, why just lie? Or just don't say anything. We could have a lot of money because I had in my mind that if she sold a lot of homes, we could uh, move out of our lower middle class home in our neighborhood that was rapidly changing and declining, but she, she couldn't do it. She sold one home the whole time she had her license, and that one to a friend who just wanted her to have the sale, despite what she had told her about the truth of the house and the truth of the race. She wouldn't lie on her taxes, and when the free application for financial aid asked her how much she had in her bank account, she and my father, and in assets, she went and looked at the most recent statement and put the figure on there, which was baffling to me. When I was an independent student filling out that form for myself after I had finished undergrad and had a child, I put in that space negative dollars. I don't have any dollars. It was usually true anyway, most of the time. It was difficult growing up in a house with a person who hates liars as much as my mama did because I was a type of child that was always doing something she wasn't supposed to be doing. I would break things by accident, taking them apart to see how they worked, like my engineer father, like that one time I broke her two-sided recording extended play tape deck. I would be way across the big street that separated our neighborhood from the next, navigating a winding country road that didn't have sidewalks to get there, and I would try to tell her when she came looking for me in our neighborhood that she had simply missed me when I was returning from around the corner that I hadn't been on the other side of the street. I would beat up a boy because he started it, and then when he would come to the house to tell on me, I would make my eyes real big and say, Mama, I haven't seen this boy all day. I was reading Faulkner. You can quiz me. <laughs> a person who hates liars as much as my mama did knew when you were lying. She might not call you on it, but she knew and she let you know she knew with her face, but by accident because her face never lies either. Growing up in a house like that, you just kind of stop lying because you don't want your mama to talk about you the way she talks about liars and you don't want her to hate you like she hates liars. Over time, my sister and I came to tell the truth spontaneously and often not of our own volition. We tried not to be snitches, but my goodness, we were too young to know how to avoid being completely honest without technically lying. At the same time as my mama hated liars, she wouldn't let us call certain people liars, people in authority, even if they were lying. This is because, in general, calling someone a liar, like Joe Wilson of South Carolina 2nd District did to President Obama during that joint session of Congress in 2009, where he stood up and said, you lie, doing this is rude. I remember this boy I went to middle and high school with, his name was, well, I'm not going to say his name. But this boy was a pathological liar, a teller of tall tales. If he was late for school, he would say the CIA had broken into his home and he had to tunnel to school through the secret passageway his Navy SEAL father had built in case of such an emergency. He would lie about absolutely anything, anything. But instead of saying to him, instead of saying to the boy, <laughs> you know, you lying, we came up with a code for when he was doing so. And for in that matter, anytime anyone else was lying, we would so we would say such and such is eating biscuits again. So <laughs> eating biscuits meant someone was telling a lie. This is how trained we were all in the politeness of not calling someone a liar. And this particular boy ate a lot of biscuits. 
My mother also did allow us to say that, uh, again, that an authority figure had lied on us, even if they had. You did not want to hear a grown person saying to you, who you calling the liar? Or you calling me a liar? These are many people's last words. Mm -hmm. So we had to say something more polite, like, he was mistaken. Mm -hmm. But she knew we didn't mean it when we said something like that. Oh, I'm sorry, Mama, he was mistaken. When I was in ninth grade, my lifetime wellness teacher was a creepy, terrible white man who went on to later be arrested for sexually assaulting a student. He told us that women only lose a thimble full of blood during their periods, and that it just looks like more in the pad, and so periods really weren't that serious, not anything for us to be complaining about. I said without thinking, probably, I probably was on my period this time, I said without thinking, well, that's a lie. Later, when he saw my mama, who was a substitute teacher, he told her that I had called him a liar. When she confronted me about it, I protested that I hadn't called him a liar, but said what, that what he said was a lie, which it was. Mama said, quote, well, that's not true, but he didn't mean it as a lie. It was just factually incorrect. This muddied things a bit for me. If it's not true, is it a lie or is it incorrect? Is incorrect like mistaken? If you are willfully correct, willfully incorrect, doesn't it become a lie? If you don't have the experience to say something factual about something, say about black people's experiences of racism or women's experiences of misogyny or black women's experiences experiences of anti-black misogyny or about periods, Mike Pence, does your speaking without the knowledge of that thing make you a liar? If not, it seemed to me that a lot of people in America made a lot of mistakes and are incorrect all the time. I wonder if my mama makes exceptions for calling a country a liar, even though um, certainly America is definitely one. And that is, I wonder also, does my mama hate America because America is the lyingest liar there ever was and also a thief too since its birth and on top of that, a pathological murderer. Thus, it could be safe to say that my mama hates America because America is a goddamn liar and that's a big thing because my mama doesn't hate anybody and taught us not to hate anybody except liars. So maybe America is a biscuit eater, both a lie and a liar. As a liar, it claimed slavery saved Africans from savagery, that saved slavery wasn't all that bad, and masters and slaves loved each other like kin, that if slavery was really that bad, then white people were also slaves, that indigenous people just had weak immune systems and that's why they died, that it was only tears and not blood and bone on that trail, that Manifest Destiny was real, that all the presidents were great except for Barack Obama because he's black, and maybe Grover Cleveland, that it was a moral authority, that God was on its side, that it was great and free and that anybody who worked hard could become a millionaire. As a lie, America is a myth, as James Baldwin called it, and one that only white people have had the luxury consistently in cognitive dissonance to believe. It is the epitome of the failure of the Enlightenment project. And so I tell these stories because my relationship to truth and truth telling was shaped by my relationship to my mama's notions of lies and truth. Moreover, it was shaped by her hatred of lies and what they could do to a family, to brothers and to sisters, to mamas and daddies and aunts and uncles, to cousins, to a group of people, and to a country. I think my mama would allow me to call America a lie, though, because its lies are so lying, even if she herself might not call it one. If one prefers, we can call America post-truth, something that's been talking around a lot, but it has always been post-truth, and how can something be post from the moment of its inception, so it's just easier and quicker and more truthful to say that it is a lie and a liar. And the lies get told so much, repeated so much, printed in textbooks, and said on the news, and said in cafes, and at neighborhood watch meetings, and housing association meetings, and by the water cooler, that they themselves become a kind of truth, a lie masquerading as truth because of its ubiquity. When something so big and vile and lying and ubiquitous is the foe, snitches, black folks, women folks, queer folks, disabled folks, indigenous folks, Latinx folks, Asian folks, get far more than stitches. 
So today I want to talk about Southerners and their relationship to the truth. The lies that we tell ourselves and the truths and corrections and the most courageous of us that the most courageous of us attempt to tell and say in order that we might be able to have the effect on America and maybe even the West that my mama had on my sister and me. After all, to tell the truth is to shame the devil. I cannot say that I have always told the truth, though. Beyond those childhood lies, I have not always told people or institutions about themselves in the moment that they needed to be told. That is because I hoped that they are only mistaken or incorrect, not a lie. To call someone or something a lie requires a certain kind of proof that as a social scientist I wanted to have. But as a black person, just as my mama knew when we were lying, I know when institutions are alive, and they are usually alive. And I'll return to that idea later. And first, also, I want to say that I don't even know if I'm a part of uh, the radical South, since radical is so relative these days. I don't find truth-telling to be radical. It's simply stating the facts. I find it to be basic. But I suppose that in a lying place like America, where the truth is constructed as a lie so easily and readily, and where you can be murdered for telling the truth, I know you all remember in Mississippi Burning when Esther Rolls character says, I raised some of you, and y'all know good and well those men were white and they shot her. It's just terrible. <laughs> Perhaps truth telling in this context is radical. It's taken me a long time on account of my upbringing to see it as such, though, but again, I begin this talk from the premise that in this particular case, where we are now in America, and perhaps where we've always been, that telling the truth perhaps is radical. And I also want to begin this talk the opposite way than we usually do when we talk about a problem, because usually we start with the South and then sometimes we stay there and we hold the South up as, as a black mark on the nation, the regional exception, as opposed to the bread and butter of America that it is. But I do want to highlight uh, that the South does have a particularly uh, peculiar relationship to the truth, one that uh, is best elucidated by Lillian Smith's psychoanalysis of white Southerners. If you'll recall her work uh, talking about sin, sex, and segregation, she points to the fundamental lie that you can be close to black people, they can care for you, they can nurture you, they can be uh, your servants, but they can also kill you and murder you and they are dangerous and you must stay away from them. Of course, the latter part is a lie, but those two things had to be held together. It created a kind of cognitive dissonance that resulted in all kinds of violence against African Americans, and we can follow this trend um, in the work of Eudora Welty. We can see it in the work of Zora Neale Hurston, of Carson McCullers. These things that happen to white folks, white Southerners, and the things that they do to black Southerners when they are confronted with the dissonance, uh, with the hypocrisy of the lies of the South. Some people say they like the South better than the North because in the South, the racists tell you that they are racist. They let you know that they are good and honest with their racism. But this is, of course, a lie. Sure, there are some white Southerners that will outright call you a nigger, and that is helpful sometimes if you aren't sure if they are racist. But most, of course, will not. They are better liars than anyone in the country to themselves and to other people because of this history of having to hold many things that are contradictory together at the same time. They are the epitome of this meme. Remember, I'm going to show you this meme. I know you have seen it. That dog that be sitting in the room. Sorry about that, it's mad at me because I unplugged it. Mm -hmm. Jamie said it was going to do this. <laughs> Maybe it'll come up in a minute. The Duke historian, I think it went to sleep. No worries. The Duke historian Tim Tyson was at my institution 
this week. But that meme, you know that meme where the dog is sitting in the room and everything is on. So look at the old people like, what is this? What's going on? Um, <laughs> if I can get it pulled up, I'll pull it up later. Um, so this week, uh, the Duke historian Tim Tyson was at my institution and he was giving a talk on his book, The Blood of Emmett Till. Y'all know about that book. Um, which has been um, kind of in the news quite a bit, as I'm sure you've seen, most for its possession of a quote unquote confession of sorts from Carolyn Bryant, the white woman who accused Emmett Till of assaulting and accosting her on that fateful day that ended with him mutilated, um, murdered, and, and thrown in a Tallahatchie. I will say that I don't care about Carolyn Bryant not being alive because some lives can't be undone. And I think a lot of black people feel that same way. And a lot of black folks have said, we knew she was lying. This is the kind of black epistemology that's at work. And others said, well, here's the proof, though. She said it, and now she, or the South, or white folks, or America, somebody will pay for this lie that she told. And I thought, how is it that her individual lie or truth has more empirical weight than centuries of black institutions black intuition, logic, and experience. No one black or white at that trial could have stood up and said, you lie, like that congressman, not least because it was impolite. If white Jesus had come and said she was lying, he would have been crucified again. Our regional manners, our manner of doing things, is often violent and antagonistic towards truth. So I think I became a social scientist. My undergraduate work was in literature leaving the speculative halls of fiction behind because I wanted to get some kind of proof of the lie, proof of the truth, too. I believed naively that the core of the Enlightenment's promise of a moral science that would benefit all of humanity had only been temporarily derailed by racism and capitalism and ignorance and the inconvenient fact of global slavery and imperialist domination. If fiction was a speculation on the truth, though sociology, I found, was mostly racist lies. Like my forebears, Ida B. Wells, Anna Julia Cooper, W.E.B. Du Bois, Drake, and Caton, and even white folks like Howard Odom, John Shelton Reed, I thought undoing lies would lead to justice. I don't know why I thought the master's tools meant anything when Audre Lorde had already told me they hadn't other than the fact that we have all, including black folks, internalized the lie that black people are liars, even murderous ones like America is. And I don't have to rehearse the history for you of all the times black people have been lied on. But Charles Murray, who wrote The Bell Curve, is still out here lying with his cooked up numbers and statistics and getting paid, while black women like Maxine Waters and Susan Rice are getting death threats. And this isn't to minimize any death threats that Charles Murray is giving, but whatever. Um, <laughs> that money will feel good with, even when you <laughs> when you get death threats. Well, I'm not paid enough to get as many death threats as I get. Uh, it's not enough money. Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about um, Ida B. Wells and her um, and her work. Um, and her truth-telling work in particular. She, of course, um, had been in England um, at one point where she had given a series of lectures about lynching based on her research about lynching. So this empirical work that she had done going out to undo the lie that undergirded most lynching, which was about, of course, uh, black men's rape of white women, which most lynchings ended up being about economic um, issues, of course. So she's, she's giving these lectures on um, lynching, and she's at the same time pioneering social scientific methods and, and theory in the US. And her work um, was this personal and political work of, of truth telling. And so from Holly Springs, she had come to Memphis. Uh, with that, when that yellow fever epidemic happened and killed her parents, some of her siblings. She was radicalized by Memphis's Lyceum Circuit. Um, of course, remember that was a 19th century form of public conversations. And Wells was a public scholar whose truth got her in trouble a lot. 
So after her friend Thomas Moss, of whose daughter Wells was godmother, and his colleagues Henry Stewart and Calvin McDowell were lynched in March of 1892, Wells wrote this series of editorials in her paper, The Memphis Free Speech. The first of these editorials drew on her friend's reported dying words, which was to tell my people to go west. Wells um, did so and encouraged the uh, Wells encouraged those who could to boycott the streetcar and white businesses. And in response, the white local papers wrote about the pestilence and violence of the unknown West these indigenous people awaiting the potential migrants who were going to murder them when they crossed into Oklahoma. But Wells, not to be deterred in fulfilling her murdered friend's dying wish and declaration, went to Oklahoma herself to report back her findings to black Memphians. Of course, there was nothing wrong there. She said, you're, you're free to, <laughs> to go um, to Oklahoma. They lie and I went, it was fine. After the murder of her friends, Wells engaged in more social scientific research on lynching um, and again pioneering this work and this social scientific work and putting it in a book, a red, a red record. Um, and so in today's social media landscapes, Wells might have written like a series of blog posts, but it was kind of put in this pamphlet book, um, a red record. In response to her work, Memphis leaders had put a bounty on her head. They wrote, "These Negro, those Negroes who are attempting to make the lynching of individuals of their race as a means for arousing the worst passions of their kind are playing with a dangerous sentiment. Here, whites characterize public exposure of white terror as merely a means for riling up the black masses, kind of a lie, and offer an implicit threat. They cite um, a sentence in Wells' editorial that they call particularly um, atrocious. And of course, we know this quote. Nobody in this section of the country believes the old threadbare lie that Negro men rape white women. If Southern white men are not careful, they will overreach themselves, and public sentiment will have a reaction. And a conclusion will be reached, which will be very damaging to the moral, moral reputation of their women. So of course, this kind of truth telling is absolutely not um, <laughs> allowed. Again, once again, revealing the sin, sex, and segregation um, elements of cognitive dissonance that Lillian Smith wrote about so eloquently some 50 years later. To be sure, it was not impossible for a black man to rape white women, but Wells' research had shown that this was not empirically true in the case of the lynching she examined. Her tone, however, coupled with her encouragement of African Americans to go west, upset white Southerners immensely. So then when she gets to England, um, and um, lead, these leading British papers um, were sort of uh, scolding the South for the scourge of lynching, um, national papers responded. Um, and so there were several of these kinds of uh, the responses that happened um, to her lecture. <laughs> so one of them was, um, one of them actually calls Wells a racist. Uh, and so this is happening in the 1890s. I think this is really interesting because we often think that the calling of blacks or Latinos or Asian people um, racist is some kind of post-racial phenomenon, but this is happening in the 1890s. Um, so this, there's uh, some writing in this uh, particular paper, and they call her a racist and say, quote, she studiously ignores the lynching of white, all capital, men, and devotes all her attention to the denunciation of the lynching of blacks. This is all funny to me. Was, <laughs> so again, and, you know, it's kind of like all lives matter, but we're not talking about a white lynching because it is not um, carried out in these discriminatory ways in, at, the, at, a, at a systemic level. And so Wells' public work on these issues of justice, her truth telling, her deconstruction of lies, cost her more than some of the costs we face today. Her paper was burned to the ground and the bounty uh, remained on her head, and she, but she continued to um, respond where she could. 
Though less infamous than her rejoinder to lynching culture and the perpetrators in the South, her disagreement with temperance activist Frances Willard was a sharp critique of anti-black racism and a public one at that, one again based on her attempt to deconstruct lies. In an interview that had been circulated in the New York Voice, Frances Willard was quoted as saying, quote, Better whiskey and more of it is the rallying cry of great dark-faced mobs, which, she continued, threatened the safety of, quote, white women of childhood of the home in a thousand localities. Ivy Wells was very hot about this. <laughs> she called Willard out, not, like, not unlike what we see today in the Twitter sphere, like when Patricia Arquette at that time called for all the gay people and people of color to now rally behind women who had fought for them. Um, of course, the logical fallacy here is that gay people can also be women and people of color can also be, be women. So Patricia Arquette got called out for that intersectionality fail. This is close to what Ida B. Wells did um, in, the, in the late 19th century. But instead of online, Wells confronted Willard, IRL, in real life in England. At a lecture Willard was giving, Wells, who had been asked to respond, read from her interview in that New York voice and implored white women not to support this kind of violence, these kinds of lies against black folks. And so I cite uh, this example of Wells to say that we have been in this moment for quite um, some time where ideas that are the truth are ultimately um, constructed as lies and where people who are trying to deconstruct lies um, are finding themselves uh, the target of uh, campaigns against them of various sorts. Um, and so often I'm asked about the race chapter of my book, This Ain't Chicago, in which many of my respondents said they lied to, um, to white people all the time as a mechanism for getting away with uh, navigating the perilousness of interracial interactions in the contemporary South. And people often ask me about that. Don't you think that uh, progress would be made um, if African Americans would tell the truth to white people about what they're experiencing, and my answer is no. So just in case you had that question, I just <laughs> want to quickly, uh, no, no. But today, um, I do want to think about the um, persecution of uh, so-called progressive and radical um, academics, even though Ida B. Wells was not an academic, she certainly falls um, under this kind of uh, rubric here. So again, um, Ivy Wells gets uh, this bounty on her head um, and has to leave Memphis or stay out of Memphis permanently. Um, when W.E.B. Du Bois had advocated for peace and travel throughout uh, Europe on peace missions in the 1950s, the Department of Justice said he was acting as an agent of a foreign principal and he was indicted in the courts and by the media. The NAACP, in fact, walked away from him. When Lonnie Guarnier's nomination for the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division was challenged, she was caricatured as extreme for the measure she called for to protect the Voting Rights Act, which we would now say are absolutely necessary. Um, so this era um, in the 1980s and 90s of reverse racism, where whites began to sue for the creation of black districts that violated colorblindness, even though, of course, gerrymandered white districts also violated colorblindness. So anyway, this, this kind of idea of, of truth and lies really um, caught up in the neoliberal moment and inspired by that neoliberal moment. And we know about this in the academy. We know about the symbiotic relationship between the academy and the government that was shored up in the 1990s. Um, the racial climate on campuses had taken a turn after being relatively conservative in the wake of the beating of Rodney King. And these students, like the generation before them, had demanded more faculty of color, more academic programs that provided a counter-narrative, some truth, against the hegemonic white curriculum, more safe spaces on campus, and into white hostility towards people of color, so forth and so on. Um, but, of course, the academy always corrects itself, and the country always corrects itself against truth 
to the lie that maintains our country. So <laughs> racist and continued rape culture direction. The administration wanted to blame and praise the protests, but most of all seized the opportunity to admit the most diverse class in the history of the college to meet their bottom line. And of course, the only thing that continues to be true in a post-truth moment is maximizing the bottom line. There was recently, last week, I think, a curious incident. I was at a Greyhound bus station in Nashville returning from the African American Intellectual History Society conference a little bit early because my best friends in kindergarten had died of cancer and I was going to her funeral. I got a call, or I got a text while I was in this Greyhound station from my chair that said, do you have a minute to talk? It's a Friday afternoon at 5 o'clock. There must be an emergency. So I called her to see what was going on, and she said when she answered the phone breathlessly, there's a hit article on you in our school paper. I walked it over to the dean's office. Um, everybody over there is frantic. People were apparently running around collecting the papers for some reason um, on campus so they wouldn't be read. I never read the article, but there were many calls that came to me to my phone, many texts while I waited in this Greyhound bus station where no fewer than three fights broke out. I was concerned for my life. I was told by a fellow Memphis traveler that this He's been in many Greyhounds, and the Nashville Greyhound is the worst Greyhound in America, he said. Um, so, ostensibly the article was about the renaming of a building, Palmer Hall, on our campus that had been named for a person who was racist and had some problematical practices. The argument for renaming Palmer was very well thought out. And the argument for not renaming it was essentially, uh, we have a racist on campus, Professor Robinson, and <laughs> why should we rename Palmer when we have actual racists on campus? This is not a bizarre thing to happen um, to me, for me to be called a racist, even though, of course, that is ridiculous. But I do not, um, I didn't think anything of it. But out of morbid curiosity after my friend's funeral, I went to the Facebook page of the journal, of the, of the school paper, rather, and I saw the retraction there, and the mea culpas and the I'm sorry's and so forth. And they said that they removed the article because it contained libel against me. And I found that to be so curious, the idea that someone could lie on me um, as a black person, because I'm so used to people not believing um, what I have to say, even when it is empirically true, um, and even when it is a sort of personal truth. And so I, I recount that just to sort of articulate the ways that lying and truth are, are constructed, but in the use of the language of libel, there also was kind of the implication of litigiousness and the bottom line. It wasn't necessarily about protecting um, me or protecting the truth, but about protecting the institution's image and once again, the, the bottom line. So in closing, um, I often wonder in this truth telling um, if I'm going to become that older black woman who has survived so much that she renounces all filters and says what she pleases. I know you know these old black women, they throw their purses at you, they say anything, they just like move out of my way, that's stupid, why you got a dress on, those kind of people. I wonder if that's going to happen to me. I'm actively looking for some medicine to prevent that from happening. Please, if you know some scientists, help. I'm trying to say something. Or if I'm going to become like Toni Morrison's pilot in Song of Solomon with a closed off face that dissembles and betrays nothing. In either case, that kind of wholeness is incompatible with a lying America, which requires us to stick to the party line. And so here in this, part, in this portion of my career, I have actually turned back to literature, to speculation as a form of truth 
as a sword against lies. Because in a place so invested in mistruths and in making up stories about itself, I wonder if the only ways that we will be able to battle lies is to make up a new future, a truthful one of our own. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions or, or comments? I'm happy to take them. Yeah, I'm going to do some more work on Wells because I feel like there are a lot of pieces about her in different places. Um, there is um, a book by Miriam uh, DaCosta Willis, who was a Memphian, who wrote about um, Ida, she wrote Ida B. Wells' Memphis Diary, kind of like a um, sort of edited thing about Wells' time in Memphis. Uh, the Frances Willard case has been written about in different places um, in her biography, um, but I think pulling all those things together under uh, a particular thing would be very useful. I had thought about writing a, an intro book uh, for intro to sociology on Ida B. Wells because I remember um, she wasn't in our curriculum and the professor that I had added her in, which is how I came to think of her as a sociologist. Um, and as a pioneer, and even though W.E.B. Du Bois has been reclaimed um, and art articulated as a sociologist, as the first sociologist, um, Earl Wright II, who's also from Memphis, who's at the University of Cincinnati, has done that. Um, Alden Morris, who wrote the, that book about uh, civil rights in Mississippi, uh, has a book on Du Bois called The Scholar Denied, but we don't have anything like that for Wells, and so I think you know, I will, that will definitely be something that I will be um, turning to in the next few years. And then um, with the reading, I am uh, actually going back to things that I used to read. Um, I've been back to Zora Neale Hurston, I've been back to Toni Morrison, I've been back to um, Octavia Butler and thinking about the speculative um, uh, in terms of new writers, I read KSA all the time, whatever he writes, um, just stop this Facebook page. Um, uh, Teju Cole, I find to be very interesting because uh, he talks about blurring the line between fiction and nonfiction. What is truth? He's asking these, these uh, kind of questions. Um, and a lot of uh, black women's no new, new novels by black women, memoirs and things like that. So that's what I'm reading these days. And it's been good to not be reading like boring academic work, let me tell the truth, boring academic writing. <laughs> so it's, that's been good. Thank you for those questions very much. Yes? Uh, I just wanted to know, I was going to ask something similar. How you doing? I ain't even, hey girl, what? I didn't even say hi before you started. Hey, how you doing? Hi, your baby. I'm sorry. I know. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. What's your formal? What's your question? <laughs> practices and its commitment in some ways to maintaining this kind of myth of America if it is a, a place for people wanting to sort of deconstruct um, lies 
And this is kind of what I've been having an ambivalent relationship with sociology, because we spend a lot of time like proving things, like empirically. Black women more likely to be evicted. Little black girls more likely to be suspended. Black men, you know, blah blah blah. So much data, and nothing, nothing changes. Um, and it's it's frustrating. We're always refining our methods, though. We're like, maybe we need some hierarchical linear modeling here. This will really convince people that we are right. And so, you know, and so the the um, the discipline has been frustrating for me. And then. Um, the academy um, more generally has been um, frustrating for me. Certainly my current institution has its own quirks and difficulties and, and things, but I'm, I'm thinking about um, the academy too. I have, um, in terms of immediate work coming out, um, I have uh, a book with my colleague from graduate school, Marcus Anthony Hunter, Chocolate Cities, which is about uh, kind of reframing geographies of the U.S. through black experience. And it's uh, on California Press and it'll be out in January. And then um, I have a book that I'm writing at some point. Um, it's under contract with, the Cal uh, with North Carolina again um, called Soul Power, which is about Memphis uh, 50 years after the assassination of King and the kind of lies that um, nostalgic lies about a colorblind, racially harmonious past with music and barbecue um, that we tell about the city that's very much incongruous with uh, black people's lived experiences there. So it begins kind of recounting the bridge protest, the I-40 bridge protest, and kind of goes um, from there and assesses the state of of Memphis 50 years after the assassination of King. So it'll, it'll come out late 2018. And uh, I'm gonna work on a memoir that builds on the uh, essay that I wrote for the Oxford American uh, Music Issue. So um, I'm working on that first, because I can't think about myself so now. So, <laughs> so I'm working on that, uh, working on that right now. Mm -hmm. And, and left literature because I felt like literature was not doing anything and I wanted to do something. Um, but literature is doing a lot. Literature is how I got to sociology, like literature is, like literature is doing a lot. And so I think it's, an, it's important to just keep telling the truth. Now some people say, so I've also been thinking about this a lot. I'm sure you've seen some of the Afro pessimist workouts. So some people say that like, not that all of this is pointless, but that like, why I keep saying the same thing over and over and over again? Blow capitalism up, blow you know, blow it up, right? Um, and I am too tired to blow anything up. I just want my IKEA kitchen. Um, it's really important to me. <laughs> My husband's on tour right now, and I'm like, did you make enough money for my kitchen? You can't come home until you do. So um, so I think that it's important. When I go back and read Wells or Hurston or Du Bois, it's really sad to know that they're saying the same things that we're saying today, but also like, I'm on the right track. <laughs> and so maybe, and we see a lot of black artists kind of being more speculative. I, Frank Ocean's last album was very much like, let's just party and then we'll die and we'll figure it out in the next life because this is a chapter. Um, so whatever the kind of uh, next thing is or whatever, you know, I, I, 
someone else will find it and it will be it will be important and that's why I think you should do it um, I think it's still very important to, to do that work even if it won't be implemented or if someone will implement it incorrectly which happens all the time <laughs> Did you hear me for the past hour? Oh, yeah. oh, oh, oh. Mm -hmm. My brain blow up again. Mm -hmm. So, um, Casey was talking last night, and um, a lot of what people were just like, I sent questions about, which is like, what are the youth saying? Because he's going mm -hmm. around to the schools. And on the way over here, kind of get one that had to drive, which is who I am. Mm -hmm. But it was about the, the MPR, it was just about talking like the different Massachusetts public school system, mm -hmm. about how, like, um, this, I think this other copy of Boston are like to know this, that there's just this like boil up of like craziness. Mm -hmm. Where kids are like swastika, going bananas. And um, I'm wondering like what the difference is, is with the students you're seeing that are in like the big city in Memphis mm -hmm. compared to like a rural place, and that this is a primary white institution and you're saying roads. It's still primarily white. Yeah, but mm -hmm. I mean, like, so they're going to, so some of the students that you see coming in, like, what's the kind of feeling you get about just this, like, really crazy place of time where everybody else mm -hmm. The one thing people are saying is, too, people are saying is, like, well, the great thing is that people are finally talking about stuff, you know, it's like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? like, the yes, I do. Who's a man who hates women is a man who hates anybody of color, you know? Yes. Like, Yes. In the most visible place. Yes. So what are you seeing as a student response? Because I see a lot of students following um, Donald Trump's tweets who they think they're funny. Yes. And just treating him like he's a harmless poop. Yes. So what do you see? Yeah, I, I mean very, very similar things. Uh, so I see two things. One, uh, the difference between uh, kind of what happened to me in 2015 with the big national blow up and all of that and PSA wrangling a bunch of people to, to sign a letter um, in support of me. This was certainly, with this paper thing, was certainly on a smaller scale, but uh, people were sending me screenshots of comments that students were making um, on this girl's post. And one of them was like, your article was taken down because it was a trash argument and poorly conceptualized and Dr. Robinson was published in Rolling Stone and don't you ever, you know, write anything like this again before you, so that, like these kinds of, these were the kinds of like texts that people were sending me screenshots of, uh, of the things that were on Facebook and I, so I find on the one hand like the kids are all right, like there's a lot of sophisticated stuff going on some of them were so hilarious I was like this is brutally true like things that I would not say myself um, because they're not nice um, so this so there was that happening which was which was lovely but then there's also um, I'm teaching a gender class this semester and we begin the class with like the week's gender trauma and I'm very concerned about the campus um, and I do find that the uh, trauma from the presidential election is kind of spilling over into um, how people are engaging. So some person posted about, uh, there was an abortion, uh, women had organized an abortion speak out on campus and uh, some guy posted, abortion is murder, and you know, you know like all those kind of things. And um, yeah, there were a lot of those kinds of responses. They just had a spring event, and I knew on Monday morning we were going to get that email about reported sexual assaults, and we did. And I was just like, you know, so there are those kinds of things. Um, yeah, just just repeating that are happening, and um, that's why I do the mentoring that I do because I feel like one day there will be enough of those students who can be in power 
Because right now, the folks who are saying abortion is murder or this wasn't rape or, you know, blah, 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 um, are the people who are going to have more power in our society anyway. And so uh, I'm just hoping that there will be some kind of critical mass of, of these students who are, I mean, very much all right and who are have more energy than I do <laughs> um, to kind of keep keep pushing. But I do think we will continue to see we will, this this rise. The SBLC gonna be in business for a long time because this rise um, in hate. I don't think it's just a, it's just a spike. It's a global global phenomenon right now, and you know it's like Star Wars. It's definitely not fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question, Jeff. Yeah. I really appreciate your talk today because uh, uh, it made me think of Joe Fagan's concept of sincere fiction. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I've always thought you should change that to insincere fiction. Because mm -hmm. I think uh, you know, our country, particularly white people, has had a long history of fabricating stories mm -hmm. that make ourselves feel good. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I think one of the reasons why I was attracted to sociology as well is this idea of truth telling. Mm -hmm. example of, of this happening and why I feel like you know sociologists are even in more trouble because we've been affected by Fox News's long uh, kind of fair and balanced thing and I remember it was about five years ago that I became so annoyed with NPR's like uh, fair and balanced thing like they would be like um, this person believes that uh, incarceration rates disproportionately affect black people. And here's another view. No! No! One of them is true and the other one's not. Damn it. And, and so you get, you get used to that. And then our work then I think is uh, affected by that. The way we frame our arguments. We're like taking into account this person says that phrenology is real, but actually, you know, no! What? Um, so it's, it's quite uh, it's quite challenging to write um, and to keep up, keep all of that out your head when you're trying to um, do your research and write, which is also why I think some of our truths get a bit muddled when we're uh, when we're telling them. I'm thinking about Matt Desmond's book uh, Evicted, which I think is great. Um, of course, black women have and organ black women organizers have been saying this for a million years. Um, but his book has a lot of stories in it about people's experiences, but I think there's not the sort of this is anti-black um, misogynist, you know, this this is the thing that hurts families, so, you know, like, a, and the argument um, is framed in a in a conservative way. I also have been having this thing where uh, people who I thought were like radical black academics um, when I was younger and I thought they were like crazy and I was like, oh, that's how you get like that. <laughs> because they, you know, they have been kind of like butting up against this thing for so long um, and they say whatever they want and it's true, um, but I'm like, oh, you know, you're not being diplomatic. So this part, partly I'm a southerner, partly I kind of came of age uh, intellectually in the fair and balanced kind of um, um, era affecting all of our work. So, yeah, it's uh, it's tough. I think it affects social sciences, especially where it's all like 
this is an opinion. Like I collected 132 interviews. This is not an opinion. Um, <laughs> but you know, it it doesn't matter. But I do think that the uh, the counter narratives are winning because these you know kind of main narratives get ratcheted up. But also when the main narrative gets ratcheted up, people die. Like that guy that murdered the guy, the older black man in New York. Like, cause we black men rape a white woman. What is happening? What? So, um, yeah. So I think we have to be louder. I guess we have to up the ante too, and that means not making, not couching our research in, in these conservative ways. Because I think about that with implicit bias too. Like why, why not just say racism? <laughs> and this, these are the ways that it kind of cognitively affects all of us. Um, but we have to say implicit bias because it's not nice to call people racist. It's like it's not nice to call somebody a lie. or early 2000s by this like black boy group and the guy is just like why are you lying why you, have you all seen that why are you lying why the fuck you lying and it's such a funny thing because every time somebody white would say um would say a thing you just post that meme that that was like problematic you just post the meme under there um and it's a shorthand that not everybody understands but i think it's it's allowed more people to participate in this conversation. And I think that's really important because going back to the question of the youth, the, you know, memes are the kind of language and you can have this discussion um, without necessarily having the fancy words of the academy, but you can, you can sort of participate in the public discourse about evaluating the truth of various statements. Um, I was also going to show that uh, sketch from the Chappelle show where he has the jury duty where he he goes through uh, various ways he, he pretends he's in one year for a for various juries R. Kelly trial Michael Jackson um, so forth and he just the this I use the sketch a lot um, in race classes because it demonstrates that black people have a different set of ways of approaching epistemologically what is truth and how you evaluate innocence and guilt and morality and these different things. Um, and so I think that's, you know, that's very important. I do a lot with Key and Peele too. I think they are amazing. Um, I think their work is really amazing in, in thinking about and talking about race. Um, but th their work in particular also makes me think about the limits of pop culture because they just had to, they had to end that show as things got worse. Because um, they, they had a cop sketch about um, a cop just like indiscriminately murdering people and it's funny but not and it's painful. And you, I was like, oh, they must be ending this show because this is, <laughs> this is off the chain. Um, and there were several other sketches that season that were pushing like that. Um, and then Jordan Peele's Get Out now has done a significant amount of work um, in thinking about racial microaggressions and the relationship between race and power. And that's why I think uh, that pop culture allows us the speculative space to unmask lies in a way that uh, empirical science has not been able to do. And it broadens our ability to have conversations with people. My students wanted that. I mean, we, I had to have a whole class on Get Out, and then some people, we were trying to talk about it without spoiling it. It was just, you know, it was difficult. I was like, we can't have a class field trip to the theater, even though y'all, this is what y'all really are trying to do. But this is my intro class, which is predominantly white, and they want to talk about it. 
And yeah, so I think popular culture is so important. I'm, you know, I'm from that Stuart Hall uh, school of, you know, really treat pop culture as, as, as text, as, as valuable work. Even though I sometimes, I'm a, when the radio on, it's like, oh, is my daughter listening to? And I'm like, oh, let me write an essay about it, I'll feel better. <laughs> Thank you all so